Thank you very much. What, a, what an honor and what a privilege to be here. I first want to wish you good luck. You'll move back to my own beloved state of California. It won't be too far from Grass Valley. Royce's early origins. I grew up, of course, in Sacramento, about 18 miles from where the great Josiah Royce grew up. But I want to begin by uh, saluting my dear friend and brother, Professor David Lambeth, for his leadership in bringing us together. Let's give him a hand. He's done a magnificent, a magnificent job, very much so. And we know your brilliant book on William James that you've already written, and we anxiously await that next text on James and Dewey in wrestling with religious experience and taking us even beyond where we are. I also want to salute the, uh, the graduate students who gave wonderful presentations. I was there on Friday from 12 to 4. And for me, of course, it's so very important to keep track of the younger generation. That James and Royce are not isolated philosophical icons sitting in some museum. The question is, how did they remain vital and vibrant? And I think Brother Alex is here. Just stand again. Now, let's give this, give this brother a hand. Come, Brother Alex. <laughs> of course, for the William James Society and the Josiah Royce Society, as well as the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy. Very, very humble that you would ask me to put forward some reflections on these two philosophic giants, as it were. You know, Josiah Royce begins his magisterial history of modern philosophy. He wrote, young age is 36 years old, The Spirit of Modern Philosophy in 1892. He says, philosophy is a critical reflection on what we are doing on what we are doing. So I want to begin with the question, what are we doing here? And I understand this historic gathering as an act of intellectual piety. And in that magnificent presentation of Professor McDermott, dear brother John McDermott, you began by invoking Plato's euthyphro. What is piety? the grand philosopher of piety, George Santayana, and I'm so glad we've invoked his name, his sense of indebtedness, how it is that the past, the ancestors actually provide means by which we cope with the present, that they in many ways give us a life and we in return give them an afterlife by remembering them but remembering them in the spirit of that wonderful line of Martin Heidegger, questioning is the piety of thinking. That we question them in such a way that they become more vital and vibrant in our time. Now, one of my criticisms already, of course, in the last two days is that we really haven't spent as much time on their context. James and Royce, they emerged during the age of empire when those nations between the Orals, the, 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 between the Atlantic Ocean, the Euro Mountains, Europe dominated the world, one half of the globe living under colonized, subjugated, and dominated conditions. And at the same time, they're wrestling with what? The American inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Europe. We cannot talk about the legacy of Ralph Waldo Emerson without talking about his courage of saying, yes, you're the first new nation, yes, you're the city on the hill, yes, you're the moral exemplar, but you are intellectually underdeveloped, if not downright retarded. <laughs> the first golden age of American philosophy, of philosophic geniuses like Royce, and we could characterize Royce in part as his career and part of the triumph of genius over precocity. Because he started so young, 22 years old, PhD, done, 27 years old, already a professor, 29 years old, already at Harvard, 36 years old, already written a classic, different lectures, 40, dead, 60. Triumph of genius over precocity. I would characterize James as the triumph of genius over generosity. He's so kind, helping everybody, supporting everybody. When do you have time to enact what we understand genius to be, that unique 
combination of boundless energy, stern discipline, and cultivated talent. Now, Emerson himself says in Representative Man, that wonderful essay on Shakespeare, he says what? He says the, the genius is the most indebted person because you have to engage in a kind of stylish grave digging to keep the voices of the dead alive as you try to find your voice and bounce your voice up against that voice so that the, that cacophony of voices down through the corridors of time might constitute a force for good. And that sounds like a jazz quartet, doesn't it? Jazz orchestra. How do you find your voice? in such a way that you understand their context and what they're wrestling with, and you're open to your own context and what you are wrestling with. And what is our context? The second Gilded Age. What is our context? Market, free market fundamentalism, aggressive militarism, escalating authoritarianism at home after the emergence of the age of America in the 1940s. And of course, in order to really tell the story, we'd have to say something about the second golden age of Harvard philosophy. Yes, it's true that at first golden age you had Royce and James and Palmer, Munstenberg, Santayana. Two geniuses out of five. No, three actually. But the second age 1945 to 1980, Quine, Rawls, Putnam, who's actually here. I know he doesn't like me to talk about this, but I'm telling the truth today, Brother Hillary. <laughs> Goodman, Nozick, Cavell, all philosophic geniuses. And yet the legacy of James, the legacy of Royce, has tremendous difficulty getting through that second age. We need to tell a story about that. Yes, there are the invocations of pragmatism and two dogmas of empiricism, the classic of 1951 by Quine himself. In some ways, it's as much Clarence Irving Lewis, Quine's teacher, the conceptual pragmatist. More Lewis than James in many ways. But it's also the later Carnap moving toward pragmatic dispositions in terms of various kind of linguistic systems, pragmatic payoff. But the difficulty of trying to keep alive this legacy of James and Royce through this second age, and therefore when we talk about the younger generation, that's what I'm so very much concerned about. Where do they get the resources? Where do they get the examples? Remember that wonderful line of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, actually it's page 177. In the English translation, the examples are the go-kart of, of judgment. How does a younger generation make good judgments about how to engage in philosophical reflection in light of good examples? Where do they find those examples as it were? My first thesis is this. The relevance of Royce, and in many ways the relevance of James, even though I'm talking primarily about Royce today, has to do with the fact that Royce was a self-styled humanist, which is much broader than philosopher and much, much broader than professional philosopher. He engaged in professional philosophy, yes, but he was a self-styled humanist. He took very seriously, line 38a of Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living, and an unexamined life is not a life for the human. And he knew from Vico's 12th paragraph of the new science, the human comes from Himanda, which means burial. And what is the relation of the quick to the dead in order to preserve the legacy for the young? And that burial has to do with what? Engaging in this paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E -E that Royce was an evangelist for paideia, or what the Germans would call Bildung. And what is the legacy of paideia, of humanism in this broader sense, in our highly specialized, highly professionalized, more and more commercialized and commodified academy? Are there any spaces left? Must one circumvent it? 
Because paideia is about what? It's about engaging in that formation of attention, to use the wonderful phrase of Simone Weil. The formation of attention, the shift from the parochial, the superficial, the provincial. Well, I shouldn't use that term with Royce. Negative forms of provincialness. Royce likes provincialism. He's got a universal cosmopolitan conception of it. But how do you get people to shift from the superficial to the substantial, the frivolous to the serious? What I love about Royce and William James is you always get the sense that they are engaging in issues that they have thoroughly invested themselves. It is a self-immersed orientation. That's what self-styled humanists are about. Issues of life and death, issues of, of pain and sorrow and grief and joy. And not engaging in a valorizing of an isolated discipline, not even interdisciplinary. They have a de-disciplinizing sensibility. So even when they engage in technical reflection, it's always connected to something larger, the synecdochic imagination, a relation between parts and wholes. Even the metaphor of the absolute in Royce ought not to be cast in such a static and ontological way. He's continually trying to get us outside of our parochialism when we're obsessed with the fragment. That's precisely what James had in mind in that wonderful letter of September 26, 1900, when he writes to Royce, that even though we disagree, we've got the same object. An object is in italics in that letter, you recall. Of course, we've got the magisterial biographer, uh, Clendenning here. Where is Brother Clendenning? Yeah, there he is. You correct me if I'm wrong, my brother. That object is, is in italics. That paradoxical, physical, moral, spiritual fatness. It was invoked earlier yesterday. Fatness, capital F. About so many others concerned with the skinny fragment. So yes, we might disagree philosophically. Yes, we may disagree intellectually. We have very different temperaments. You emerge out of poverty in Grass Valley. You go to UC Berkeley when it's hardly a university. You're obsessed with Schopenhauer. Arthur gets me down. <laughs> it's true. James did the same thing to Arthur that Goethe did to Von Gleis. He took the book and threw it against the wall. Too dark. Can't take it. He was already wrestling with dark moods. He didn't need that. <laughs> and of course, Royce's great biography of Goethe remains the unarticulated moment in his corpus. I would love to see what he would say about that grand self-styled humanist. In many ways, Royce himself ascending to that same level of dictar, poet in the greatest, broadest sense of the word. But by self-styled humanist, what I mean here is, is that Royce, and this is one thing we must take with him, especially young people, we've got to not just draw a radical distinction between a calling and a career or vocation and profession, but the degree to which Royce in his calling knew it was thoroughly connected with a recalling, a remembering. And that wonderful word that he uses in the first section of the Spirit of Modern Philosophy, the rewording. We need to reword philosophy in such a way that it speaks to our times. He even invokes Matthew Arno implicitly. Philosophy is a criticism of life. Of course, in, in the problem of Christianity, he explicitly invokes Arno. St. Paul in, Protest in Protestantism essay. Why? Because he's in the same tradition of that larger humanist project of various sorts, expressed in various ways, that is being lost today. We can talk about what particular forms it's taking in light of what's being lost. And ironically, there is a profound sense of loss in Royce and James in their day of this same tradition. Why? Because every generation that engages intellectually in this grand humanist project, articulated philosophically, poetically, however, has this deep sense of loss. I, mean, I would argue, in fact, that um, we're really concerned about the legacy of Royce. We have to look in a variety of, 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 of disciplines outside of philosophy. I think H. Richard Niebuhr is one of the great legatees.
Josiah Royce. You read his posthum, the text he published after his death by his beloved son, who is our dear colleague here at Harvard, Richard Niebuhr. Faith on earth, the loyalty, the fidelity, the fiducial constitution of, the human, of human existence, the fiduciary dimension of the human condition. And, of course, we've got the grand student, towering figure in his own right, Gordon Kaufman, sitting right here coming right out of Royce, working with Royce there at Yale, and his recent text, I'm told, haven't read it, very Roycean, without the absolute. Of course, Gordon gave up on that a long time ago. No last chapter in Hegel's phenomenology for Gordon. I agree in some way. But for Royce, it's not just about the ontological status of that absolute, but the ways in which it can be used and deployed to keep alive this larger legacy that he believes has everything to do with constituting a force for good and for him overcoming, in existential terms, his own profound sense of isolation and fear of abandonment and fear of impotence coming out of those impoverished conditions of Grass Valley and how he would interact with the cultural thoroughbreds of Harvard and the fact that he would be embraced so lovingly and supportingly by this William James upper class. I know that Brother McDermott has real challenges with James's class sensibilities, but that relationship, that partnership is a cross-class partnership. It's unbelievable. There's nothing like it in the history of not just American philosophy. There's nothing like it in American intellectual life in the last 70 or 75 years. It's even more than Goethe with Schiller at Weimar. This is an American example of two persons, giants, geniuses, working so closely together. This is what I meant yesterday when I said, there is no Royce without James in the sense of the Royce that we critically interrogate. But there's no James without Royce in terms of the James we critically interrogate. They would have had their own trajectories independent of each other, much less impoverished, much more impoverished much more impoverished. Now, what is it then about this, this self-styled humanist project? Well, for me, you see, it has everything to do with the baggage that I bring to philosophical discourse and the baggage that I bring to Royce and to James, which is all great self-styled humanist projects put a primacy on the catastrophic the traumatic, the scandalous, the monstrous, the horrendous, the calamitous. Go to Walter Benjamin, Kafka, Adorno, the grand self-styled humanist of Europe about to descend into totalitarian darkness, the centrality of the catastrophic. And the professional... The specialized is to do what? To tame it, to domesticate it, to hide it, to conceal it, to smooth it out, deodorize it, manicure it. And yet the stink and the stench still oozes out. And some, some people have to wait for Hitler to acknowledge the catastrophic in Europe. Wait for Stalin to acknowledge the catastrophic in Europe. Or America, wait for 9-11 to acknowledge the catastrophic in Europe as, 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 as if the catastrophes are not happening every day in the quotidian, in the familiar. And I come out of a tradition that begins with the catastrophic off the slave ships and for 244 years wrestling with what are the conditions under which paideia, that formation of attention, that cultivation of a self with self-confidence and self-respect and self-regard, that maturation of a soul that has the courage to confront the night side, the dark side, the catastrophic and the horrendous, and still emerge with a smile, still emerge without bitterness, still emerge with a sense of connecting to others and trying to cope in America's daylight. The social death of slavery. The civic death of Jim and Jane Crow, American terrorism. The age that Royce and Joyce write, this is American terrorism at work. There's lynchings taking place every two and a half days for over 40 years. What do you have to say, Royce? I've got an essay on race quest questions. What made you think about it? I went down to Australia after my 
break down and I discovered aboriginal peoples. And I discovered, my God, there's an analogy here. Got Negroes in America, aboriginals in Australia. Maybe I'll say something about race. Atlantic Monthly got space for me. James, what do you have to say? Well, I've got a letter to the Springfield Republic newspaper. This lynching must stop. Thank you, Du Bois, my blessed student, for reminding me, for pushing me. We were just talking about my dear brother Eugene. Is that right, my brother? I'm not putting him down. I'm talking about the degree to which even they, given our questioning toward them in the best sense of the word, the highest tribute we give to them of this kind of interrogation, what kinds of ways in which they are marginalizing the catastrophic and the horrendous and the calamitous in everyday life. That's part and parcel of the self-styled humanist project that is so fundamental. And that's why I entitled this talk on the tragic and tragic comic. Because there's no doubt that Royce, James as well, but especially Royce, Professor Don Locke is absolutely right about this, Royce is obsessed with evil understood as unjustified suffering, unmerited grief, his own as well as that of others. That is an obsession. I believe that's an honorable obsession. I come out of Hebrew scripture. He who is greatest among you will serve the widow and the stranger and the most vulnerable. I come out of a tradition that takes seriously the story about that first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus, who in many ways is a rich footnote to prophetic Judaism. That's the kind of Christian I am. I know it's a footnote, but what a footnote it is. But it's about what? Beginning with the catastrophic. Beginning with the suffering. I love that about Royce. And that's why that last chapter, the spirit of modern philosophy of pessimism and optimism and the moral order is one of the high moments in modern philosophic literature, not because just because of its form. It's an essay in the form of a lecture. It's oral. It's conversational. But he tries over and over and over again to wrestle with some kind of philosophic resolution of the problem of evil. He invokes Mozart. That doesn't work. He invokes Augustine's sacred canopy as somehow the overarching good justifies the evil. That doesn't work. And in comes that figure who haunts him from the very beginning of his philosophic career, Arthur Schopenhauer. And I say openly and publicly, any philosopher who is not haunted by Arthur Schopenhauer needs to go back and read Schopenhauer. That's a sign. Reminds me of what has been said about any cultural critic who can't appreciate the genius and insight of Edmund Burke, whether you agree ideologically or not, something's wrong with you. For me, Schopenhauer is that kind of litmus test. These days it'd be Nietzsche, but for me, Nietzsche is just a footnote to Schopenhauer. Rich one, though. I take footnotes very seriously, as you know. <laughs> I already said my Christian tradition is a footnote, so you know I take that footnote very seriously. <laughs> I take Nietzsche's footnote very seriously, but no Nietzsche without author. Schopenhauer. The obsession with Schopenhauer. We should notice a footnote. How un-American can it be? that the first graduate course in philosophy ever taught in America was taught by a minor's son on Schopenhauer at John Hopkins. That's about as un-American as you can get, given the optimism, the optimal mood, the obsession with possibility and opportunity and liberty. And here comes dark Arthur Schopenhauer in the new research university in 1877, January. I love that. Dissonance, juxtaposition, challenge, even in some ways implicit subversion of what would emerge in so much of what we consider American philosophic discourse. We'd have to go to the plays of Eugene O'Neill to see Schopenhauer's legacy at the center of the American grain. The ice man cometh long day's journey into night, a moon for the misbegotten. That's Schopenhauer right there with that Irish genius. But the American theater, the American philosophy, no bridges ever built. Interesting. The high moments in Royce's text are what? References to Ibsen. Emperor in Galileo. Why? 
because he knows Ibsen embodies the hell of the irrevocable. Those last chapters, those last pages in chapter 5, the problem of Christianity. If you really want to know the absolute and what I mean by absolute, he says, then do a deed and try to undo it. The absolute is more concrete and real and practical than any other kind of example of, of even the particular you might come up with. He says the same thing in Sources of Religious Insight, page 153-54. That's, what that's what's absolute. And that is Ipsonite to the core, be it dollhouse, be it wild duck, the past deed that you cannot undo that will come back to haunt you and undermine you. Do you have what it takes to deal with the consequences of the choice that you made? And of course, this, this holds for nations. Enslave these people and see what you come up with. A civil war. Jim Crow and lynch them and see what you come up with. Deliberate ignorance and willful blindness. Act as if somehow they are invisible to invoke Ralph, Ellis, Ralph Waldo Ellison, named after Ralph Waldo Emerson. If you don't think the chickens will come home to roost, you reap what you sow. That's what, in part, Royce is doing. And of course, the American Ipsit is the late great, my dear friend Arthur Miller. I'm going to wrestle with three dimensions of time, the past, the present, and the future American style. That's Arthur Miller's genius in part. Part of the same larger humanist legacy that we're talking about, which means what? So much is at stake. The second claim in regard to self-styled humanists takes us back to Plato's Republic. The book 10, line 607b5. The traditional quarrel between poetry and philosophy. And we know that was a fight over what? Plato's attempt to displace Homer. The emergence of philosophy over against poetry as a source of paideia, as a source of that formation of attention and cultivation of self and maturation of soul. Plato says, no, I have a better replacement because what? I'm in mourning too. And Plato says, my piety is manifest in what? Preserving the memory of that idiosyncratic, essential chap named Socrates so that the world will always remember him and in my act of piety and mourning to unleash new conceptions of paideia and education that will push poetry to the margins and put philosophy and dialectic and argument at the center. Keep those metaphors at bay. Be suspicious of those tropes. And look for those logical arguments. I don't want to be too reductionist with Plato because we know he's, he says it poetically. It's one of the ironies of Plato, right? It's a poetic rendering of a critique of poetry. Even given his former portrait, he burned once he met Socrates. But Royce, and for us, takes us back to this quarrel. And I opt for any love of wisdom, philosophia, Goes to school with poetry. And by poetry, I don't just mean verses. You remember what Beethoven described himself? He said, I'm a poet of tones. Duke Ellington, poet of temple. Stephen Sondheim, poet that renders character by song, a playwright in song. The poetry has to do with the imagination enacted. Wrestling with catastrophe, horrendous conditions. It's not anti-philosophy. They must be in conversation. Royce's project must embrace those powerful essays on, like George Eliot as religious teacher. 1881, what a powerful text. Somehow, he says, she's speculative, she's skeptical, and she's poetic. What a self-description. Well, you read him on Browning, who he loves so deeply. And the Paracelsus and Paracelsus and, and April, the dying April, the, the poet. Paracelsus, the logician. Browning. Conflict, contestation. Browning's theism. We can go on and on and on. Where is that Royce? We need that Royce. Of course, we need James, given his love of Robert 
Louis Stevenson, the French novelist. And, of course, Royce's lover, Dostoevsky. I'm sad that he never got to check off, though, but it's another lecture. It's very important to juxtapose the tragic and the tragic comic. Royce is tragic to the core. What is the tragic? Obsession with freedom, godlike potentials of courageous persons, but hitting up against Anange, hitting up against limits, like the demagogue in Plato's Tamiya's hitting up against those constraints. But the freedom itself enacts a dignity and an affirmation of a possible moral order that's being violated by present circumstances and the hubris in the free character. But the tragic comic is something else. Now, I've been criticized recently because I, I've, I've distanced myself so much from pragmatism uh, because of my obsession with Chekhov. One of my fundamental questions is who would be the philosophic analog to Anton Chekhov? We don't have one. We don't have one. Hume is comic, but in the end it's a failure of nerve. The backgammon playing means he doesn't want to step too far to the edge. Wittgenstein, maybe. Any other candidates, please let me know. Because he's tragic comic to the core. If he could say with Beckett. Try again and fail again. Fail better. That wonderful line in Worsford Ho, his last prose fiction of eight, 1983. Jacobian to the core. How do you begin with the catastrophe? and lyrically cope, morally cope, knowing for the most part it is always already there. The steady ache of misery is such that if you don't come up with resources to deal with that catastrophe you cannot eliminate, you are going under. I don't see the tragic comic in Royce. I don't see the tragic comic in James. But of course it's no accident that black folk in America emerge with Catastrophe Express, the blues, Ralph Ellison's definition of it. It's always already there because you're wrestling with spiritual and psychic death alongside the social and the civic death, even in present day circumstances regarding the legacy of these forms of death. And the only way you deal with such death is what? Allow yourself to be so courageous that you think for yourself. Yet you still empathize so that the coward in you dies and the courageous emerges. And what I love about Royce is he puts a primacy on courage, on endurance, on perseverance over and over and over again. And that is a virtue we don't talk about in the academy, partly because maybe it's not enough of it. We come so well adjusted to the specialized, professionalized spaces that courage is pushed to the margin. But for Royce and James, that's the starting point. And if you're not talking about that, then what are you talking about? Serious business. Now, we also have here, my dear brother, one of the towering figures, and I believe, in fact, that his work embodies the best of the future, or so much of the best of the future of pragmatism. And he comes all the way from Brazil. Catholic education, it's a complex world. Roberto Unger, Roberto Mangiango, Mangiero Unger. I was blessed to teach with five years, just like I was blessed to teach with Brother Hillary, the last course he taught here at Harvard. You know how blessed I've been to teach with both Putnam and Unger. Same year. I haven't come down yet, been levitating ever since. But the point is what? Take a look at the self-awakened, pragmatism unbound indispensable reading for anybody concerned about not just the legacy of pragmatism, thank God Professor Dracula and Kingley invoked this yesterday, but of the larger humanist project haunted by Schopenhauer wrestling with not just the tragic but the comic. Now he doesn't opt for the tragic comic, that's one of our disagreements. I've been pushing Chekhov on him for years now. He resists. <laughs> 
We'll work it out because I think I'm right. I'm not a relativist about these things at all. <laughs> somebody's wrong. Somebody's right about this. <laughs> Absolutely. But the point is what? The point is this self-styled humanist project that engages in philosophic discourse, absolutely, absolutely, that can even be technical if you like, even on that wonderful line of Royce's characterization of Schopenhauer. He had an erudition vast rather than technical. He had manifold labors rather than professional completeness. Those are wonderful lines, powerful lines for me in terms of my self-understanding of calling and vocation, but it's also at work in the self-awakened, pragmatism unbound. And how do we think about the legacy of Royce and James? How do we think about the legacy of pragmatism in the larger humanist project, given where we are now? We need more discussion of that. And I'm going to bring this to a close because I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Anybody who doesn't talk about catastrophe after 9-11 really missing out on something. We had talked before about indifference in the dialogue with Professor Locksworth. That indifference, one trait that makes very angels weep. And can you imagine a philosopher saying, well, you know, I'm rather indifferent about the victims of 9-11. I've got work to do. But for many of us who've been wrestling with catastrophic conditions before 9-11, we have the same perception. I'm rather indifferent with those present industrial complexes. I'm rather indifferent about... Those chocolate cities and 50% of those young people not graduating from college. 1% of the population owning 51% of the wealth. I'm rather indifferent because I've got things to do. Fine. What kind of defense do you have intellectually in light of your calling? What are you wrestling with? What is the catalyst for your work? Is it the last professional paper? Fine. Do you ever get beyond the professional papers? What about the crisis? What about the suffering? Not just in a homiletical and didactic way, because yes, nothing wrong with technicality. Roy spent the last year of his life obsessed with symbolic logic. And I'd have to ask Professor Putnam whether he gets it right or not. Whether Russell and Whitehead, Cantor, Girdle, and others would take him seriously. But what a legacy. It's an ambiguous legacy like any legacy. But I think in part, that's what we're doing here. That's what's so beautiful about the cacophony of voices that we have heard beginning on Friday. And that's why I'm blessed to say these few words as part of the conversation. Let me stop there, brother. We'll open up for questions.